Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Phoebe Jones and I'm with Women in Dialogue in Philadelphia. Women in Dialogue is a um, non-governmental organization with consultative status at the United Nations. And here in Philadelphia and in other places, Women in Dialogue runs the Crossroads Women's Center and their sister centers in London, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. We want to welcome everyone to the webinar, Valuing Caregiving, the Unwaged Work that Protects People and the Environment. Uh, we see that we have over 100 people participating, and people have weighed in on the chats from, and we can see from that that we've got people from all over the world, and that's fantastic because this is indeed a global issue. When we applied to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women back in November to do a workshop for their March 2020 conference, little did we know that a global pandemic would not only cancel that conference and our workshop, but also give new and deeper meaning to unwaged caregiving work that protects people and the environment. Our five panelists will be speaking to that deeper meeting. And I'll be letting them know um, when they speak, when they have one minute left. And that will be followed by 30 to 35 minutes of discussion. And we invite you, if you have a question or comment, to type that into the chat option, which you should be able to see at your bottom of your screen. I'd like to first introduce Margaret Prescott, co-founder of International Black Women for Wages for Housework, and women of color in the global women's strike. Uh, she was the leader of lobbying efforts in Beijing that won the government agreement to measure and value unwaged work and economic statistics, and is an award-winning nationally syndicated radio journalist on Pacifica Radio. And Margaret, I'm going to find you to unmute you. There we go, okay, Margaret. You should be on. Okay. Are uh, you seeing a message from me, Margaret, to accept the unmute? There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. All righty. Thank, Thank you so very much, uh, Phoebe, and welcome to all of you from so many different parts of the world. Uh, Phoebe, I appreciate your help with time because I've got a piece of history to get through, valuing women's caregiving work from Houston 1977 to Beijing 1995. So that's quite a bit that I'll be going through quickly. In 1977, I was an alternate delegate from New York State to the first congressionally mandated conference on women, which included elected representatives from all U.S. states and territories. Uh, now, I was elected. This happened because black and brown women, Puerto Rican and indigenous grassroots women, organized in New York City as the Coalition of Grassroots Women and we fought to be able to get tickets to the New York State Preparatory Conference where delegates were going to be voted on. There we ran our own slate and this resulted in the election as delegates to the national conference that was held then in Houston, Texas in 1977. Elected was Beulah Saunders, a past president of the National Welfare Rights Organization, Pauline Hayes, who represented the American Indian Movement or AIM. I squeaked in as an old in it, but was able to function as a full delegate at the huge Houston Conference. Now, my organization, Black Women for Wages for Housework at the time, together with the Wages for Housework campaign, worked with Beulah Sanders um, from the National Welfare Rights Organization out of New York, Johnny Tillman, also a past president of the National Welfare Rights Organization out of California, and Christine Marsden, uh, a white, low-income uh, woman from Washington State. We formed the Pro Money Coalition and together we defeated workfare, the workfare requirement being put forward by conference uh, organizers. We rewrote the entire plank and we won getting it passed. And on the screen, you can see some photos of us uh, celebrating, including Beulah, myself. And Beulah, I was a lot younger then with my Afro puff at the top of my head. It's an interesting story how we won it. And there's really no time to tell that story. But just to say, we were able to get the support of conservative women 
and from Southern delegations who were intrigued by our Every Mother is a Working Mother theme. It certainly was a fusion victory. And I just want to share with you, a highlight a key section of the final language that was passed in the National Plan of Action that then went to the President and Congress to be implemented. Then uh, Carter lost the election, it never was, but it read, the elimination of poverty must be a priority for all those working for equal rights for women. And just as with other workers, homemakers receiving income transfer payments should be afforded the dignity of having that payment called a wage, not welfare. Indeed, we later learned that Johnny Tillman, a black woman out of South Los Angeles, who also served as president of the National Welfare Rights Organization back in 1965 said, I will quote, of the late Johnny Tillman, quote, if I were president, I'd start paying women a living wage for doing the work we are already doing, child raising and housekeeping, and the welfare crisis would be over just like that. Housewives would be getting wages too, end of quote. Margaret, uh, I just, there's a request to slow down because some of the people were um, Anglophone, not the mother tongue. <laughs> so, okay, okay, I'm terribly okay. sorry. I, okay. Okay, we then uh, organized to get to the second UN World Conference on Women held in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1980. It was there that we learned the UN figures that women do two thirds of the world's work for 10% of the income and 1% of the assets. That was put out by the International Labor Office. We immediately use these stark statistics to press for counting women's unwage work. We had taken the work begun by welfare mothers in the United States and the family allowance movement in Europe to the United Nations. At that conference in Copenhagen, we called for paragraph 103 in the platform to be considered by governments to include calling for women's unwaged work to be in the GNP. We went around chanting and holding signs. Paragraph 103, women's unwaged work in the GNP. Well, we didn't win it there, but we learned an important lesson. We learned that we had to find a direct voice in the official government conference. When these conferences happen, there's an official government conference with government delegations. Then there's the non-governmental organization conference, and they happen at the same time. And we had to find a way to be able to influence what governments were actually deciding. It was all um, well and good to have an NGO conference, but you needed that direct influence. So after we lost in Copenhagen, some of us got together and organized ourselves to get non-governmental uh, organization status in the UK as well as the US. And we successfully applied for UN status. And we were granted category two status. It's now called special status. And that is Women in Dialogue, Phoebe, our representative, our facilitator today. And by the time we then got to the third UN World Conference on Women held in Nairobi, Kenya in 1985, we were armed with having consultative status at the UN, meaning we had access to lobby governments. We feverishly worked in the non-governmental conference taking place simultaneously. We lobbied so hard at the government conference that the rumor went around among governments that these housewives were in dialogue all over the place. With the strong backing of our African sisters at the NGO conference and with the support of other grassroots groups and also with government representatives from some of the countries of the global south, we won paragraph 120 in the official conference document called the forward-looking strategies for the advancement of women it was referred to in the media as one of the most important decisions of the conference and let me read some of what it said the remunerated and in particular the unremunerated contributions of women to all aspects and sectors of development should be recognized and appropriate efforts should be made to measure and reflect these contributions in national accounts and economic statistics and in the gross national product. 
Margaret, I, I hate to say it, but you have one minute to do the whole Okay, uh, and then it went on to say that concrete steps should be taken to quantify the unremunerated contribution of women to agriculture, food production, reproduction, and household activities. Now, the language we won in Nairobi was a breakthrough, but we wanted it strengthened. So we mobilized to get to the last UN World Conference on Women held in Beijing, uh, China in 1995. We were 57 delegates strong from the global south and global north. We were armed with a petition that garnered the support of more than 1,200 NGOs from around the world, representing millions of urban and rural women entitled Women Count, Count Women's Work. And there we won several paragraphs um, on this issue. There isn't time uh, to read them to you now, but we can make them available to you. And we were also armed with the UNDP report that put a value of $11 trillion a year on women's unwaged and unpaid work. Um, uh, basically out of time. So I am not able to talk about the central role of women of color, of international black women for wages for housework, but we were there every step of the way, um, making sure that the voices of Black, Indigenous, and Latino women um, were heard and how racism is used to divide us. Uh, we did win in Beijing, by the way. Um, it was a, a miracle somehow. And I have to say that the CARICOM delegation, the Caribbean uh, countries were critical in that, in particular the late Adai in Guyana, who was part of the official CARICOM uh, delegation. Uh, in Beijing, and a lot of credit also given to Selma Dames that we'll be we'll be hearing from, um, because she worked day and night to make sure the language was exactly what we wanted. And since the end of the UN decade on the issue of unwaged work, we've been pressing for time use surveys as a first step in quantifying our work, as well as for the work to be valued. And an important piece of that work has been to press for the redefinition of who a worker is to include those of us doing unwaged work. For some of us, this has been a life's work. And now with the coronavirus, the whole world can see how dependent we all are on caregivers, how we're counted on, but not seen as deserving of resources and wages in our own right. And we intend to change that. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Margaret. Here, here. That's great. And that gives us a good entree to introducing Selma James. Selma is the founder of the International Wages for Housework campaign. Um, she is the international coordinator of the Global Women's Strike, co-coordinator of the Global Women's Strike, and the author of many feminist classics, including a new publication coming out this fall, Our Time is Now, Sex, Race, Class, and Caring for People and Planet which is bound to be another classic and certainly right on time, Selma James. Thank you. I love it's wonderful, on, yeah. really. Uh, can I speak? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, it, it's wonderful to hear the history once again of um, the, that we made at the UN. And I want to start by saying that the question, raising the question of the value of women's caring work it tells you a great deal about how that work is viewed. That work is invaluable. There is no sum that could and that could wrap up what we do and how much we do. We know we do two or three times the same the amount that men do, but the fact that reproduction of the human race must have a financial value in order to be recognized is scandalous and does not represent the society that we want to live in. We are carers. We are not sorry that we are carers, but we are very tired of being poor carers, number one. <laughs> number two, we are also very concerned that people assume that if we, if they don't assume we're caring, they assume we're there. And therefore the caring will go on without recognition, without acknowledgement, and without the fact that there are other things we want to do 
besides caring, but we do not want to have to choose between being a 24-hour carer and being 24 hours without caring so that the caring is not done for the people whom we love. We want all the choices. We want the power. And I want to say something about that power. When you become a mother and you are poor, that is a tragedy that I, I, I cannot express my feelings about that. It means that the, the people who are the most precious to you, whom you have helped to create, you are not able to help them and to care for them as you would like. So that the question of the poverty of carers is the question of the poverty of the human race in reproducing, in helping to be reproduced, in raising themselves to adulthood. Um, no, I have I have my papers in disorder. This is not new. Carrying them? No. Yeah, I wanted to say, Margaret pointed to the fact that we now cannot, they cannot deny that we're carers. They depend on us for this coronavirus pandemic. Unfortunately, we must look again at the situation of carer and pandemics because this is not the only one we face. There is first of all the, the pandemic of the environment. We stand in danger of being eliminated as a human race and that the whole world will be in a disastrous state. We are already facing crises in a number of parts of the world, including in the UK. They don't speak about the flooding that people are having to face here. In addition, there is the terrible pandemic of poverty in the world. This very successful um, a capitalist economy, I'd like to know where it's successful besides in those areas of, of cities and special islands where the rich are able to congregate. Most of us get by. Some of us can't get by, and increasingly, most of us find it impossible to get by. We are fighting, often fighting for our lives at the same time as we are trying to protect the lives of others. And finally, there is the question of living in a world which is made up of constant wars and occupations where the pandemic is such that we our lives are not worth much i can think of three or four series one but not only where we are constantly in danger so that our caring is not merely Normal, our caregiving is to protect against tragedies which envelop us or threaten And it is that that we want reflected when we talk about the value of the work that we do. The value of the work is, we, it is invaluable, but what it, we are dependent on the carer to protect life when it begins in the middle and when it ends. Now, there have been the social movements that Margaret referred to and Johnny Tillman talking about a wage for housework and in 1972, some of us put that forward and fought for it and then discovered Johnny Tillman somewhere along the line and discovered also that Virginia Woolf a most distinguished uh, feminist, a great writer, spoke about the need for women to have a living wage of their own so they could make the decisions in life against war, among other things, but also not to 
with some rights not to become a, a, a copy of what men had become, to find our own way of living and our own way of caring for ourselves and each other. She's been a great inspiration to us as Eleanor Rathbone has been, who fought and got us family allowance. You have family allowance in Canada. You have family allowance in most of Europe, but you do not have any family allowance in the United States, the richest country in the world. You should really do something about it. I understand something is in the pipeline. Selma, I you think, have one minute. Okay. I have to jump then to, the, to what we proposed, which is the care income where those of us who it's part of the, grand, the Green New Deal for Europe and we, the Global Women's Strike, are part of that. It means that those of us who take care of people and those of us who take care of the natural world both should get an income for doing this work. And that immediately poses the question of what work we want to do and what work we don't want to do anymore because it pollutes us and it pollutes the environment and it pollutes our minds and relationships. It is terribly important that this, um, that the care income is very, is, is put forward and helps us to build an international movement because this is not an, a care income for the wealthier countries to eke out a bit. This is a, 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 an income for all the women of the world and all the men of the world who want to cease perhaps doing the work that they, that they hate and that doesn't like the environment either and wants to build the world and save the world. A care income for all of us. Selma, thank you so much. Really, the time is now. Our time is now. That's great. Thank you. Um, I want to now, I'm thrilled to see that we are joined by Liz Hilton. We hadn't seen her on. Um, she's in Thailand, and it looks like she was able to get the, uh, the juice going. So um, Liz. Um, Liz is a member of the Thai sex worker organization, the Empower Foundation. Sex workers in Thailand have been organizing under the banner of Empower for 35 years and have been part of the global women's strike since 2015. Empower is also one of the founders of the Community Women Human Rights Defenders Collective in Thailand. Liz Hilton. Let me unmute you. And Liz, you, there you go. Are you on, Liz? Okay, Liz, we're not able to hear you. I think you unmuted me. This is Liz Keo yeah. Harris. Wrong. Okay, all right. Okay. Liz. Welcome to Thailand. So t women in Thailand carry the responsibility of caring for the extended family. For the middle class and the wealthy, the material needs are usually already covered, so care can just be expressed by concern and kindness. But in working class and poor families, the basic needs of our struggle. The family can't be raised by hand alone, so cash has to be found. We leave our children with our mothers or our older sisters, and we go to the city to find our work. With no qualifications and no capital, we can find work in sweatshops, farms, construction sites, or as domestic workers. The jobs are low-waged, unprotected, and precarious, even though the pa on paper the Thai labour protection laws are so beautiful. A minority of us, having done all the jobs available, decide to do sex work. It's the one job that gives us the chance to not just provide for the daily needs, but to build the family dreams and end generational poverty. Many people believe it's wrong to sell sex. The same people often admire those who head corporations who sell food, water, shelter, and healthcare. 
We don't understand how demanding money for the basic needs of human survival is a respectable way to make a living. But those who sell sex are looked down on, deemed immoral and arrested as criminals. Women, including sex workers, have been relied on in Thailand to see the country through HIV, tsunami, floods, drought, bird flu, swine flu, economic boom, bust. Uh, women's work is the invisible safety net for society. That whatever man-made disaster comes along, um, women are relied on to get us through it. In power, we have lived through 14 different governments. They've been elected civilian governments and also self-appointed military governments. The most recent military government held a general election last year, and unsurprisingly, generals were indeed elected. And this is the government we have now. The military is very experienced in controlling us, but has no experience at all in caring for us. The latest example is just two days ago, the order to close all entertainment places was enacted without any provisions for the over 100,000 women, heads of the family, who no longer have any income at all. So that we have a, we don't know if we have a budget deficit, but we do have a care deficit. Like Corona, the military coup of 2014 also exposed the weaknesses and strengths in society and in the movement. NGOs had been talking about development and building our capacity while they built careers and projects that never seemed to involve giving women cash or autonomy. During the five years of the military government, their influence receded and we could see each other more clearly. Empower began to talk with other women, mostly mothers like us, who are fighting to protect the life, livelihood, land, and natural resources of their communities. Uh, Liz, there's been a request you slow down a little bit, and you have two minutes left. Okay. Oh, good, I get to breathe. <sighs> Women doing waged work plus age unwaged work of caring, and a third shift, the unwaged work of defending rights and the environment. The photo you are seeing is our collective, that's us. We are about 40 women from 19 different struggles who come together as Community Women Human Rights Defender Collective. Many of us face malicious prosecution, forced eviction, threats of assassination, uh, extrajudicial killing, and so on. Caring should not be such dangerous work, but it is. The last few years have seen life for women here get harder with a 20% increase in poverty, family land being seized, street vendors banned, 2,000 factories closed down, incarceration of women has reached number one in the world. This was all before corona fell on top of us. One crisis does not cancel out the others. We come together to show how our individual struggles are part of the same larger struggle. We call on the state to recognize that work in the home and on family land has great social and economic value. This Caring work must be paid a living wage provided for in cash or land. Coronavirus has made our demands more urgent. It is showing very clearly that if wages were paid to all carers, the country would have been in a much better position to survive corona. What corona exposes must not be allowed to be covered over ever again. Caring for our family is not work that we want to be stopped from doing. We are, however, claiming wages for that work and we support the call for a care income, a caring economy, and a caring society. When we have won all that, maybe then we can think about whether sex work is bad or good or just is. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. That's great. We really appreciate it. I'm glad you could get on from Thailand. I'd like to now introduce Peggy O'Mara. Peggy was the editor and publisher of Mothering Magazine from 1980 to 2011. Her books include Natural Family Living, Having a Baby Naturally, A Quiet Place. She is an award-winning journalist and uh, currently writes at uh, www.peggyomara.com. As someone who used Mothering Magazine as my Bible in raising my daughter in the 80s and 90s, and uh, with her also being a point of reference for a book that um, I'm a co-author of called The Milk of Human Kindness, I'm particularly thrilled to be introducing Peggy O'Mara. 
And now I will unmute you, Peggy. Give me one second, please. Okay, Peggy, are you on? I'm here. Thank you, Phoebe, for Great. those lovely words. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with everyone. Um, <clears throat> the global implementation of measuring and valuing unwaged caregiving work depends to a large extent on the actions of governments. These actions, however, are determined by the degree to which a society values caregiving. How can we elevate the value of caregiving in society? How can we create public policy that improves the well being of caregivers? When society does not value caregiving, women can be ambivalent, even resistant, to payments for caregivers. In a 2018 National Review article, one author dismissed wages for housework as a radical feminist crusade and said, although it's true that women on average still do more housework than men, and although it's true that that's not fair, the solution is not for women to demand wages, it's for women to demand that men do more. The problem with framing the argument in terms of some ideal 50-50 partner structure is that it ignores the needs of children and the desires of parents. Parents want to spend more time with their children and research supports their critical importance. In her book, Being There, Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matters, Erica Komazar says, children learn emotional regulation from the moment to moment soothing of the mother. The child is not able to self-regulate until after age three. The directives of health organizations, such as, the, such as the American Academy of Pediatrics and the World Health Organization, echo this critical importance when they recommend exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and continued breastfeeding for one to two years. Breastfeeding requires the mother's presence. While some US women undervalue their work inside and outside the home, they do value breastfeeding. And researchers such as Dr. Julie Smith have calculated how much counting breast milk could add to the gross domestic product. After all, infant formula is counted. 83.2% of US women initiate breast breastfeeding, but tragically only 46.9% are still breastfeeding at three months. Employed mothers typically find that returning to work is a significant barrier to breastfeeding. Women who intend to return to work within a year after childbirth are less likely to initi initiate breastfeeding, and mothers who work full-time tend to breastfeed for shorter durations than do part-time workers or unemployed mothers. Only 25% of companies have lactation programs or make special accommodations for breastfeeding, and hourly workers face insurmountable obstacles as they have little control over their schedules and cannot take breaks to express breast milk. Lack of maternity leave or other family supports are also significant barriers to breastfeeding. In one survey, each week of maternity leave increased the duration of breastfeeding by almost one half week. However, the family policies getting the most attention in the US presidential campaigns are childcare and paid family leave. While it is good to see a vigorous national conversation about family policies, these proposed policies fail to include parents who are unpaid caregivers. The focus on working parents serves the purpose of keeping mothers in the paid workforce. Mothers with young children hold conflicting views about working. Only about 33% in the US say that working full-time is ideal. 44% say that working part-time is ideal. And nearly 20% say that not working at all for pay is ideal. Plus, stay-at-home parents account for about one in five US parents, or 18%, and number 11 million. So while policies like affordable childcare and paid family leave are important to millions of working Americans, direct payments to families would help all families. Pending legislation in Congress, the American Family Act of 2019-2020, would amend the Internal Revenue Code to increase the child tax credit, make it fully refundable, and pay it monthly. Analysis of this legis legislation shows that it would reduce child poverty by 40% in the US. Policies like affordable childcare and paid family leave are important to millions of working Americans, but for the 11 million parents at home, direct payments to families like ta child tax credits, like child tax credits would be significant. Peggy, you have uh, less than a minute, thanks. One example of a successful program that makes direct payments to families is the Magnolia Mothers Trust, a new initiative that provides low-income, 
African-American mothers in Jackson, Mississippi with $1,000 a month for 12 months, no strings attached. The results of this initiative have been outstanding and a larger study began this month. 100% of the participants said they now had enough money to meet their basic needs, 80% were able to pay their bills, and the percentage of those who completed their high school education increased by 22%. The advocacy group Family and Home Network, which, with which I consult, calls for inclusive family policies, ones that include everyone. According to the organization, the ways in which families meet their income earning and caregiving responsibilities should not determine their eligibility for support and services. In fact, most parents move in and out of the workplace, modifying their employment and caregiving practices over the years as the needs of their family members change. Public policy in the U.S. is disconnected from what mothers of young children want and from what professionals recommend for children under three. To build a resilient society, we need public policy that protects the needs of our most vulnerable citizens. During this time of pandemic, when many shelter at home, one wonders about the caregivers. Who is taking care of them? When governments talk of sending cash payments to their citizens, will caregivers be included or will payments be made only to wage earners? Everything starts with the value we place on caregiving. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. That's great. We really appreciate hearing from you. Uh, and now I'd like to call um, on Reverend Liz Theo Harris. She is the co-chair with Reverend Barber of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral vi revival. She's the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary and is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church. And I'd just like to add that those of us who are involved in the Poor People's Campaign are really honored to have leadership from this incredibly important movement with us on this webinar today. Reverend Liz Theo Harris. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. And um, thank you for pulling this really important <laughs> webinar together. Um, you know, I want to start off uh, where Peggy was just speaking about the importance of, of care workers in this um, pandemic, in this crisis, um, which uh, um, I think we're all seeing still unfold uh, and, and trying to make sense of. But yesterday, uh, there was, there's been a lot of talk um, about, you know, uh, this pandemic and, and how we're, as a nation, as a world, um, addressing it. And, and we've been trying to put out in the Poor People's Campaign that, um, that indeed the, the kind of inequality, the devaluing of life, the devaluing of care work, the devaluing of women and children is right at the heart of this pandemic. And that unless we actually take seriously the demands of poor women, of, of care workers, of, of families that are struggling with poverty, we won't actually be able to get out of this mess. Uh, you know, one of the things, I'm, I'm a proud member of the National Welfare Rights Union. Uh, much of my political organizing comes out of homeless union organizing and welfare rights organizing, and indeed, as folks that are aware of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, we do have roots in the Poor People's Campaign of 67 and 68, which, which may have been called for by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, but if it hadn't been for Beulah Sanders and Johnny Tillman and some of the heroes that we've been talking about um, on this webinar, uh, would have not been really a Poor People's Campaign. And so, um, when we, when we talk about this campaign, we have pulled together a powerful set of demands, um, demands that include living wages, that include universal health care, that include free education, and that include um, strong welfare benefits, that include guaranteed annual income, and that include caring work as, uh, as work that should be paid work, um, should be valued work. Uh, if we're following what's happening with this pandemic, uh, there's been a lot of conversation right now about um, um, income payments, um, you know, $1,000, $1,200 being paid to different folks that are, um, uh, you know, being hit by, by this pandemic, by the economic crisis that's happening around it. 
if, if you read the fine print of the bill that is being proposed and is in the process of being passed, the bills, the stimulus bills in the US Congress, uh, they're making it very clear that they do not value care work. They do not value the contributions of the poor. They do not value low wage workers because in fact, if you were so poor as to be able to not afford to pay taxes. If you're so poor that you're, the wages that you make are, are so little that um, you're already experiencing poverty. If, if you're in a position where you're caring for loved ones and not receiving income, you don't receive this uh, income payment, um, and which is completely counter, as we all know, to the, um, to the demand of a guaranteed annual income that is adequate, that is decent for, for folks to be able to thrive and not just barely survive. I want to talk a little bit about the impact of, of poverty and the reality of poverty in uh, the United States and the connection of it to the rest of the world. There are 140 million people in the United States today, before this pandemic broke out, who are poor or low income. Um, more than half of those, 73 million of those, are women and girls. Uh, you know, there is not a town or a county anywhere in the United States that if you're working minimum wage that you can afford a two-bedroom apartment. And, and there's nowhere where if you're, you're trying to care for your loved ones, um, care for those uh, who need uh, care, um, that you can afford to make a living in this, in this society. There are about 12 million people who are homeless, um, and yet there are more abandoned housing units than homeless people in the United States. But women um, and their kids are being forced into living in in their uh, in their cars under bridges, um, you know, uh, uh, because uh, because there's there's so much um, uh, poverty, deprivation, and so much of a devaluing of life. Perhaps people have heard in this pandemic that that the government is going to respond. Well, I got some reports in Kentucky uh, right now. The legislature is proposing to cut uh, programs that are about caring for women, caring for battered people, uh, ending abuse happening in families so as to be able to pay to bail out corporations. In my own state of New York, uh, the legislature is, is considering and proposing cutting Medicaid uh, so as to be able to bail out the largest corporations in the world. McDonald's was on Capitol Hill two days ago lobbying so that they wouldn't have to pay for paid sick leave for all of their employees. Those folk whether they're caring for people as they see or serve them food or in people's homes or in nursing homes are the front lines of who needs to be bailed out. But instead, our nation is bailing out the rich. They proposed $1.5 trillion in, uh, they put that into the, uh, into the budget, um, the, sorry, the Federal Reserve bailed out Wall Street with $1.5 trillion. Well, that amount of money would result in ending student loans altogether. Liz, you that, have less, less than one minute, thanks. That amount of money could, could really value care workers, could put forward wages for housework. We have enough to go around. The question is, can we build a movement that has the political will to be able to make the powers that be actually build the life that all of us deserve. I want to end with uh, one slogan or two slogans from the Poor People's Campaign, one that comes from welfare rights leaders around the country, which is take away our poverty, not our children, because they are taking away poor mom's kids because they can't afford health care, because they can't afford housing, because they can't afford water. The other is, when we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. When we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. And indeed, we have seen this to be true in the welfare rights movement. 
We've seen this to be true in the anti-poverty movement. We've seen this to be true in service workers across the country and world, and we need it to be true now. Liz, thank you so much. That's Reverend Liz Theo Harris from the Poor People's Campaign. That's wonderful, thank you. Uh, our final speaker is uh, sick, not with the coronavirus, um, uh, but we have uh, someone who will be speaking for her. Um, we were going to be calling on Letty Mosambite, who is the Secretary General of Sintrahol, the Domestic Workers Federation, and who is also with the Global Women's Strike in Peru. Letty was instrumental in getting the Peruvian government to ratify ILO protections for de domestic workers. Uh, but speaking for her today will be Nina Lopez. She is originally from Argentina. She's now in London with Legal Action for Women and Hola Nina. Let me get you on. I'm very sorry that Letty cannot be with us. She's not well. Uh, and I want to say for her that she's a fantastic organizer. She's been campaigning and the federation that she's the general secretary of is a federation that she formed and it has over 10 groups, uh, 10 affiliates all around the country. She's a, a lady has been campaigning for many years as a, a, a trade unionist, but also as part of the global women's strike to win the ILO Convention 189, which was passed in 2011. That was really an international movement, which her organization was part of, but included domestic workers organizing in many, many countries. And it was a fantastic victory when it was passed. And it gives, uh, you know, it proposes a written, a written cont uh, contract, an eight hour day, the right to pay maternity leave, to a weekly day off, the right to paid holidays, the right to form trade unions. So it's very far reaching, it's the kinds of rights that of course other workers have, many other workers have, although decreasingly in these days, which domestic workers won at the ILO. And ever since, they have been campaigning all around the world to get the local governments to ratify the ILO convention, and quite a few countries have ratified it now. It took a number of years in Peru, and Lady was instrumental to make that happen. She was a fantastic lobbyist. When I heard what Margaret was saying about what we did uh, at the UN, I was there for quite a lot of it. I, you know, I immediately thought of Lady because Lady is extraordinary in the way that she campaigns with all the Congress people, and that she puts pressure on them and calls them and says, but you don't want to hear from domestic workers. And they say, yes, of course we do. She, and she then threatens them that she's going to tell, you know, the women in your home who are doing all the work, you wouldn't be able to go out to work if we weren't doing that work, etc." And she kind of shames them into supporting the ILO convention. And as a result of her movement and her extraordinary uh, or organizing powers, they were able to win ratification in 2018. And uh, <clears throat> so that now Peru is one of the countries that has ratified the ILO Convention. Now, as part of the, of the global women's strike, uh, Lady and her organization there is also fighting, campaigning for work in the home caring work to be recognized, valued, and made visible, and for every worker to receive a, levy, a living wage, including mothers and other carers, whether they work in their own homes or as domestic workers working in the home of others. And also, they're demanding the right to pay time off for workers who need to care for a relative. Without this right, women will, will always be disadvantaged when we go out to work. And that is a very important demand, which some workers in Peru have, are campaigning for, which means that you can take two days of work and basically it's paid, so your employer is paying for the caring work that you're doing for your family. She says caring for others is a fundamental human relationship. It guarantees the development and well-being of people, especially children and those who are elderly, sick, and disabled. 
Without this care, neither society nor economy would exist. All this work is being done largely by women who are the primary carers, and we are the largest workforce because we do this work at home as well as in the home of others without our labor rights being respected. This essential contribution to society should be a source of power, including economically for the women and men who do this work. Instead, we face impoverishment and inequality. Women do the majority of the work in the world, not only at home, but also in the fields and in the community. Valuing caring work would help close the income gap between women and men. We would stop doing the triple day. Many mothers do several jobs and that leaves our children alone at home for a long time. And that is very, very common among domestic workers who are looking after the children of others. The government must plan and budget for caring work because waiting for people to be in extreme poverty to access social programs leads to exploitation and corruption, a system that affects us women more because we take responsibility for the survival and well-being of our families. I know that there are many women in Peru who depend on various programs to give you, you know, free or subsidized milk or subsidized food. And there's a lot of corruption in the running of those programs, which is why she is raising this in particular. The elimination of poverty must be a priority for all institutions that claim to defend the rights of women. Nina, you have time. Your time is up. Okay. Without the recognition of caring work, such elimination is impossible. And finally, this pandemic has shown that caring work is the most humanitarian work in the world. Therefore, it is urgent that it should be economically recognized and valued and paid by government. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And thank you. Please pass on our thanks to, to Letty for sending the statement and uh, wish her well. Uh, so, uh, Nikki Adams, who is going to be gathering questions from people, have asked if people could start to post their questions on chat. She will do her best to gather as many of them as she can and pass them on to the uh, panelists to respond to. So, please start uh, typing in your questions or comments and uh, we can respond to them. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I wondered, Nina, since you're still on, if you want to say anything about the uh, environmental uh, connection and also the care income uh, statement uh, that you were working on. Okay, well, we, we have been here in London. We have been putting together, Selma and I in particular have been involved with the Green New Deal for Europe. We were very glad to be invited to be part of that. And uh, we saw that they were putting forward a care income and then helped to work on that and to make women's work within that more visible as, and made some other contributions. We feel that it's a very important initiative that really goes in the right direction <clears throat> in, because it's looking at the whole economy and what people should be doing and shouldn't be doing and what work is as Selma raised is work that is, uh, you know, for for life and for the planet, for all life, and what work is against life and against the planet, and therefore should we should stop, should be stopped. And uh, the care income, as part of that, means that it's bringing together the care of people with the care for the environment and the care for community. It also speaks about the urban environment. And uh, it's, a, it's really an, a very important initiative and it goes much further than a basic income. In fact, the people who put forward the care income, as we did, and as uh, the Green New Deal did, re rejected the, the basic income. They didn't want that because they wanted caring to be made visible. And uh, we think that that's really important because otherwise it's a bit like you're giving money for no work while at the same time, Women are doing all this mountain of work and you don't have any money for that, which is really a slap in the face. 
We also know that the basic income, I know that maybe some people are proposing it in the US and I'm sure many of them have very good intentions. That is true around the world. But some governments don't have good intentions when they talk about it. They're really using it to cut welfare. And uh, as a result of that, uh, disabled organizations, organizations of disabled people here, for example, and in Canada have been opposing it. A care income doesn't have any of that problem. And also it makes caregiving central to the economy. And we're very glad to be putting that forward and to be part of the Green New Deal for Europe. And we drafted uh, a statement uh, using some, some of what Selma said, that it wasn't just one pandemic with coronavirus. It was also the pandemic of poverty and the pandemic of war and occupation and the pandemic, what was the other, the, the climate, of course, the climate emergency, and that caregiving had to be central to all of that if we were to deal with them. And, and it's uh, very close to what, uh, what uh, indigenous which other, people have asked for all the time and tried to live by. Well, the Mother Earth, which we mentioned, I mean, Mother Earth was, of course, the Pachamama was always, uh, you know, the indigenous way of, look of, of being part of of the environment not not being against it but being a part of it and so we're trying to go back to that otherwise we'll never win you right know, it's really essential so i think we put right. it on our website on the global women strike website and in fact i was interested by what people are raising about oh, Liz, what Liz was raising about the multinationals and the corporations and the bailing out of the corporations, because we were aware that that was on the cards when we drafted the statement and that they are going to try and take money from taxpayers and generally from poor people, from all of us, to actually give it to the corporations once again and let people go to the wall and that this is the time where we could be pressing for a care income internationally, south as well as north, not just to deal with coronavirus, but to deal with everything that we're up against. That's great, Nina, thank you. And, and Selma, and also Selma, I hope at the end we could get some final remarks from you. I also see that uh, Laura, uh, from the Global Women's Strike has put up on the chats the link where you can see that statement. And we can also send it around to everybody who's been on that. So um, thank you. Um, Nikki, uh, I'd like to, do you have some questions now gathered? Let me take you off mute. I've got, I've got at least four, but to begin with, I'd just like to say that a lot of people have asked for, first of all, people are very appreciative of all the uh, presentations but also people have asked for more information and whether recordings and transcripts will be available, which I'm sure they will be. So people wanted information on the state and federal bills that um, Reverend Liz m uh, mentioned and on some of the details of legislation that were mentioned in other presentations and some of the facts that Margaret uh, in particular um, presented. But in terms of questions, um, there's, if I give you the four and then you can choose uh, how to uh, field those, Phoebe. Um, the first was about the connection between housing justice campaigns and the valuing of care work, whether people, whether anyone on the call knew of concrete work that was being done in that area. Um, another, the second question was from Thailand, where the person said that uh, it's difficult to imagine a care income as such in Thailand at this moment and wondered whether their care, the principle of a care income had been implemented in other ways in terms of people getting paid for work, uh, for unwaged work. Then the third was how would people uh, be paid? For example, that there was a big difference uh, if you're giving, if you're paying somebody for caring for children, that there was a big difference in the work involved in taking care of a very young child or baby and a older child and how would that uh, work and then fourthly for the moment uh, what impact would uh, the valuing and care, the paying of care work have on gender divisions within the household so would it make a difference to the fact that women are doing most of the work great thank you nikki um I'm wondering if also uh, any of the panelists, there's an option to raise your hand. 
uh, if, and this is for panelists, please, to raise your hand if you particularly want to be addressing uh, any of those. But I, I'll start with um, Margaret to uh, answer, uh, start, begin some of the answers, and then other speakers, please raise your hand uh, if you want to reply to it. Okay, I'm going right, on mute. I'll I'll start with the issue of, of housing and the, the interconnection with the question on the interconnection with caregiving, um, movement for care, valuing caregiving and housing. And uh, one example is right now in my neighborhood in East Los Angeles, a group of mothers uh, have now taken over 17 homes. They started with one last Saturday, mothers and their children. And that is following in, in Oakland, um, Moms for Housing did a uh, similar, you know, similar work. And what they're doing now is they're taking over with their children um, the housing um, owned by the city that's available. And Reverend Liz Theo Harris talked about how many buildings, you know, they were um, and spaces that are empty while people right now need housing. And uh, I spoke with one of the mothers. Um, who was there with her children and, and extended uh, family members. And they're, they're very much seeing housing as a right for them and their children as part of their right and wages, actually, that they should have, right? That they and their children should not be, even if they're not out on the street, should not be housing insecure because there are a whole set of uh, people who ordinarily would be categorized as homeless, but because they're staying on somebody's couch for a few weeks or whatever, they are outside of those statistics. But in Los Angeles, um, for example, each night there are up to 60,000 homeless people on the street. And of course, that's being exacerbated now with the, with the coronavirus. So a number of us um, are active with the Poor People's Campaign also. And for some of us in the Poor People's Campaign in the Bay Area, now who's on this call and some others also, Faye on the call up in, in Sacramento, they have also been very active on this whole issue of housing as a right and supporting the mothers in particular who are making that struggle for housing. Um, in terms of the um, the legislation, Reverend Liz may want to say something about that, and Phoebe, you may want to tune in on that as well, um, because, and Peggy O'Mara had also referred to the legislation in Washington, D.C., um, in the Senate, actually, that is on hold now, given everything that is, that's going on, but what that legislation would do, it would, for the first time, establish a child benefit for people for families in the United States, because right now we don't have it. Um, you know, they have it in Canada and other places, but not in the United States. That is on hold right now. Um, others may want to deal with some other um, of the specific uh, questions. I wasn't sure uh, what perhaps people were asking about in terms of the statistics uh, that I gave out, but if there's something more uh, direct on that, I'd be glad to share that. Great, thank you, Margaret. Um, yes, so uh, Reverend Liz Theo Harris has raised her hand. Um, I'm going to unmute you. Um, I want to, did that get unmuted? Yes. Um, also, just to say, since you are responding to that question, there was another question for you, if you don't mind, Nikki. Um, it's really important that we intervene in the writing of stimulus bill ASAP. Please mm -hmm. tell us where to look. So uh, you could respond to that one. And then I will call on uh, Claire Glassman, who uh, asked to respond to the question on disability. Uh, go ahead, Reverend Liz. Great. Well, thanks so much. Um, and, and, you know, again, I, uh, people might hear a little bit of a background noise. Um, you know, uh, the kids are out of school in New York City for more than a month. And so I'm, I'm learning a lot about, uh, and, and my, and my brother's caring for my elderly parents and we're staying, you know, so we all, we all are learning a lot about, about this in this moment. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit about, about these different bills. Um, uh, so, so what we're not hearing in mainstream media much is where the money on a state level and on a federal level is coming from and what it's actually specifically going to. 
And so I would encourage folks um, uh, to actually be really looking at some of the proposed changes that are, are, are being made right now. Because again, like if you look in the New York State, um, the bill um, right now, I mean, it, there's a serious attack on Medicaid happening. Um, and it's all under the guise of responding to a public health crisis. And so we all on this webinar understand the, the irony of that, the, the immorality of that. Um, but we need to be raising these issues um, on a state level, on a federal level. Um, and, and we know that this isn't happening just in the United States. We know that countries across the world are using, you know, these crises um, to, to, you know, offer more money for the rich and, and cut programs. Um, you know, I, if, if folks are following in the United States, you know, one of the proposals that Trump is making is all this worrying about payroll taxes. Well, where payroll taxes come from is Social Security. Um, and so therefore an attack um, uh, or on, on, uh, on Social Security is underway. Very strong one right now, um, right at a moment when as we all are knowing that a, a care income, uh, income for, for folks who, who cannot work or are doing other forms of work um, is so necessary. Um, so the Poor People's Campaign has put together a series of demands that are immediate demands um, for some of the stimulus package. If, if folks, we, we launched it on a platform with Move On um, just to try to get the, the largest um, out, uh, you know, audience for it. Um, I would encourage people to go to moveon.org um, slash poverty and, and you can see the immediate demands that the Poor People's Campaign is putting out in this moment. Um, and, and part of our demands is about enacting the entire set of demands that the campaign has come up with over the past couple of years that come from, you know, uh, welfare rights moms, um, folks that are a part of this care economy, um, homeless leaders with the homeless union, you know, um, I, I appreciated Margaret uh, talking about, you know, some of the powerful housing takeovers that are taking place in this moment. Um, you know, many of us, including myself um, in the Poor People's Campaign, come from a homeless union takeover movement um, well, when welfare rights folks and, and homeless folks were, were, have been in history and are today still you know, uh, taking over abandoned lots, taking over abandoned houses, taking over abandoned buildings and, and moving people in. Um, and, and I think we're gonna see a lot more of that um, as the economy continues to, to plummet, as more and more people, um, you know, uh, cannot, um, you know, lose their jobs, um, that uh, as more and more people have folks to care for, either because they get sick because of this or, um, uh, you know, all the other things that, that that are making people um, live so precariously. And so, uh, you know, I would love for people to follow what the Poor People's Campaign is doing, but also local organizations are, are very aware and putting this out, but you're not seeing it in much of the mainstream media. I mean, I can, I can forward for sure some various resources to this group and make sure that people have them, but, but there's a lot of um, uh, danger happening right now, just as there is also, as people are saying on this webinar, you know, this is a moment for us um, to come forward with really um, these visionary, bold proposals um, that put people um, uh, who are poor and most marginalized at the center of our social, political, and economic system. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Actually, Selma James has asked to respond to the care income. Uh, and I understand Peggy O'Mara also would like to reply. So I'm letting the speakers reply first and then uh, Claire, so hold on, Selma, I've got to find you to unmute you. Don't start talking yet. Uh, where are you? Okay. Selma, you're on. Thank you. I'll be brief because others will need uh, the time. Um, I think we have to look at the care income as a struggle which is already taking place. Uh, and there are, you know, in the same way as women's uh, unwaged work is invisible and not unacknowledged. So are the struggles that women have been waging in their dozens, in their hundreds, in their thousands. I think of uh, all the struggles that have been going on in a number of African countries of women who have refused the cash crops and risked prison in order to 
plant their own um, subsistence farming um, products, which uh, will allow them to feed their families. And we have to make um, clear to those of us in the West that very often it is a struggle for land, which is the struggle for wages, that is for economic independence and for the uh, all the rights that you need once you have money in your hand. Um, I think also the struggle for breastfeeding has gone on as a, a struggle for caring, which is another thing that women have had to fight for. And there's such a glorification of everything that comes from a machine, that comes from the market. Oh, it costs money, it must be valuable. Whereas breastfeeding is free at the point of delivery and is the best thing that children and in fact many other animals uh, do best with. So uh, let's look at the care income as um, a goal that we must all have and we must all fight for it in ways that are suitable to our particular situation and the particular strength um, the struggle, um, structure of our community and land is often the way that women make a fight for wages. Okay, great. Thank you, Salma. Um, so we also have, uh, uh, I want to get back to Nikki too with the next round of questions, but Peggy, Amara, I think you wanted to respond and then Claire, um, if you could also say something briefly. So let me find you, Peggy, hold on please. Okay, Peggy, whoops. Yeah. Peggy, you're on, okay. Okay, one question about um, how to solve the division of care work among partners, uh, and I mentioned this, and I think I've read research from Sweden and other countries that have strong family supports that when there are those supports, there does tend to be more um, sharing of the workload, more appreciation uh, by the partner, perhaps the man of the work, uh, of the woman's work, so I think that, the answer to the division of the load of care workers, care work is really, again, what we're doing, valuing and uh, paying a care income to women so that uh, there would be more balance with uh, men and with partners. And uh, somebody also mentioned about <clears throat> men who are doing care work, and I think that we should acknowledge that, and, and we are speaking about women and other caregivers, mothers and other caregivers, and there's a real growth on about you know, among stay-at-home dads. There's a whole the United States National Organization for Stay at Home Dads that's very I, I, you um, have to. vibrant. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, we're in this together and helping, you know, creating this care income would really balance the gender equity and uh, uh, partners, I believe. Great. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Peggy. Um, we're calling next on uh, Claire Glassman, and she is with Win Visible in uh, London. Claire, give me a second, let me find you. There you are, okay. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, well, there's a, there's a number of us on From Invisible today, so it's great to be on with everyone. Um, just, to, just to add a couple of things. Um, first of all, to say that disabled women are working hard, you know, because Coping with disability is hard work in itself. And as women, we often care as for others as well. And in the disability movement, people have wanted to get away from recognition of carers because, because of striving for independence in the relationship. And um, in the UK have wanted to become the employers um, which um, it doesn't do away with the basic problem of um, lack of recognition of caring work because the, the, uh, the carers are still underpaid and there's still a lot of resentment and um, uh, tension in the relationship and, and the the issue of being the employer has really been exposed by the coronavirus crisis because people being the being the employer themselves 
are now having to organize the um the protective equipment and all that is the disabled person's responsibility rather than being assumed by the um, the local government or you know other agencies that are supposed to provide the state um, the state support um, anyway so we've been discussing about you know how to address the power relation and that um, a lot of the problems that people point to are to do with it being underpaid under recognized and um and the conditions so this can only help address that thank you thank you claire um yes i want to get back to nikki we also um margaret prescott wants to uh, say something towards the end and also we want to hear from selma again uh but i'd like to get to nikki now to get the next um round of questions okay okay i'm having trouble unmuting you nikki can you oh, yeah I can, there you go yeah i'm there unmuted you go. You're, you're good yes uh -huh. okay so the first one was about the relationship between the basic income and the care income and specifically the person asked what about having a basic income for everyone generally and then a care income on top of that that would vary depending on the kind of caring work that was being done. The second question is about uh, asking for a care income globally and address, raising specifically the issue, for example, of the deficit of care that happens in countries of origin when domestic workers are moving country and working elsewhere to do caring work. and. Um, that they also ask, is this demand reformist and is there something that is part of it that could be seen as being more addressing the systemic problems with capitalism? And then the third one is what actions can people take? Okay, so why don't we start, I think Selma, would that be you to address the basic income and the care income? And I think we might wanna hear from uh, Liz at some point too on the, international questions, uh, Liz Hilton, uh, and then Margaret on maybe what people can do. Uh, hang on, Selma. Um, yes, okay, yeah. you're on. Okay, uh, the basic income is, we're worried about it. We're very glad that uh, there's some money that's going to come from the US Senate. We hope it does come, because anything you get from the US Senate is what you were owed. Um, but the problem is that we want to um, look at the division of labor between women and men, and we can only do that honestly if that work is valued and that it, it draws an income in its own right. Uh, the person who is talking about a basic income plus a care income uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about it and ask other people what they think too. But I think it's tremendously important that the care income is for the caring and protection of people and planet. And it, it begins, first of all, to ensure that that is the focus of the economy and the way we live our lives. And that's tremendously important for the climate and for our relationships and for caring. And that is very, you'll forgive the expression, anti-capitalist, uh, in the sense that it, it reverses the, we are told to support the market, to work for the market, but we want the economy to work for human beings and for the planet. We don't want a, a toss up about that, that we, we will benefit and the, and the climate will go berserk and we'll all be dead. The, the focus of the economy and of the, the structure of society must be the way human beings care for each other and ourselves and care for the climate, for all the creatures on Earth. In other words, to support this life, the life of the planet 
and the life of human beings. And that in itself transforms the structure of society. Now, you don't walk into a transformation like that. You have to build a movement, a strong movement, and make it clear that that movement is international and nobody is excluded from that. It, it begins to bring us together and show the power that we have when we want to work for humanity rather than for a market which may or may not destroy humanity. Thank you, Salma. Um, what I want to propose, it's we have five minutes left and more to deal with. Um, so what I like, I wanted to see if Liz wanted to say something. Uh, Margaret, um, uh, but then have Margaret say the next steps, um, and we can sort of technically or just say we're closing the meeting at 12:30. But we can, I, if the panelists are able to stay on, uh, let's go. We can go extend it because uh, we have someone from Ireland. We have Maggie from Ireland who wants to talk about the uh, the work that uh, she has done in Ireland in relation to the Constitution. So we'll see if Liz uh, Hilton has anything, uh, then uh, Margaret, and then we will, uh, people, if people need to get off, they can, and then the, we, those who can stay on will go for another 15 minutes. So let me find you, Liz. Okay. Yes, Liz, was there, did I, un no, I did the wrong person. Sorry, okay. There you are, okay. I don't know who I unmuted, but anyway. All That's right. because you have a double Liz panel. Two Liz <laughs> on the panel is very dangerous, Phoebe. <laughs> All right, you're on, Liz, great. Okay, did you have anything you'd like to uh, address? Uh, it's interesting reading all the comments and listening to what people are saying. I don't have a lot. I did see a friend from Thailand, Phi, asking if there's any example of where, where this is already happening. And I think we're going to have to make Thailand first. Maybe other pe people that know more can name some country that is already giving a care income or paying a caring wage. Um, but I don't know that there is yet. Uh, me first. No? Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I don't think I do have anything to say for myself. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, in addition, if, if I may, to say what um, people could be doing next, I really think that I wanted to mention briefly something about immigrants and migration and also the work that happens for those of us from the Global South. I'm an immigrant from Barbados. Uh, but for those of us from the Global South who then immigrate and migrate to countries of the Global North, there is this view that somehow we don't belong there, that we're just charity cases being taken in. And, you know, a lot of us, our, our experience is that we work very hard in the Global South, in the villages where we are, et cetera, but we don't see the wealth there. It is sucked out of countries in the Global North and in some on the continent of Africa, for example, the most impoverished continent in the world, but yes, the wealthiest in terms of the resources under the ground. It's almost as though they don't care about the people up top, but just be able to get the cobalt and all of the resources that make it possible for us even to have this call or to have a cell phone or a television or an airplane. So I think that when we look at the whole issue of um, immigration and migration, uh, when we make the case that we have the right to be here and to look at all of the centuries of resources that have been sucked out of us from the global south, that has to be considered and then be put in this horrible situation of having babies snatched at the U.S. border, etc. So I, I, I wanted to at least the mention of the issue of immigrant and, and, uh, and migration. Also, um, on this issue of the coronavirus and the money now being proposed, one of the things we discussed, you know, I host the Sojourner Truth of Broadcast on Pacifica Radio, we were talking about women who are in situations of domestic violence 
and the increase in violence uh, that will happen against women because of the stress, et cetera, of this coronavirus and women being stuck in the home. This is connected to this whole issue of the basic income versus the care income. Because what the U.S. is proposing to do, because the entire economy will fall apart, is to give people money, not on the basis that we're carers and, and we earn the money, but just give the money. It's kind of like a basic income. For women who are in that household, who are not getting their own money, and who are under threat of domestic violence, we see all across Latin America, the people protesting about femicide, et cetera. So when we talk about sorting out this basic income and the care income, we have to make sure that money goes directly into the hands of women, because if it does not, women who are in the position of facing violence as one example, or having their children taken away from them um, because they're victims of domestic violence, need to have those resources. I mean, when I spoke to Reverend Barber, the, a joint coordinator with Reverend Liz about the poor and the Poor People's Campaign and asked about the basic income because the Poor People's Campaign right now is putting forward a, a basic income or a guaranteed income, but not as yet a care income, although we want them to move in that direction. And he said, well, I support both. I support people having a guaranteed income, and I also support um, a living wage for carers, including mothers and other caregivers. But in terms of what people could do, you can go to the um, women in dialogue at crossroadswomen.net. Um, and you could also go to, um, for International Black Women for Wages, Housework and Women of Color in the Global Women's Strike, you can go to women of color at globalwomenstrike.net. Also our Facebook page, facebook.com slash, slash women of color, Global Women's Strike. You could also go to the Every Mother is a Working Mother uh, Network. Um, everymothernetwork.net um, and um, uh, uh, Empower in Thailand, uh, www.empowerfoundation.org uh, for the International Prostitutes Collective, ECP at prostitutescollective.net. Um, there are also queer women who've been organizing in this, queer people, um, and that's at Queer Strike at queerstrike.net, that includes trans uh, people as well. When Visible, you heard from Claire, and um, you can go to win at winvisible.org. And then there are men, people ask about men. There are men who, who want to be carers and who want to be less slaves at the wage workplace and to be able to spend more time with their families. Um, also working with refuseniks against war and that's www.refusingtokill.net. Um, the, the care income, there is a petition uh, on the care income. People could also go to the Poor People's Campaign website, which um, Reverend Liz mentioned uh, for a lot, of, a lot of those demands. And um, maybe I'm, I'm not quite sure yeah. people could, you know, so if, if, if you're yeah. interested also in your area or, or country, the city or country where you are, on working on these issues, we really need to hear from you because we know that this has to be a global initiative. That's how we got the history I gave at the UN. That's how we got the UN to shift in that direction on measuring and value and caregiving work. It was a global effort. So we really hope that you will be in touch with you, whatever parts of Europe you're in or other countries. We know there were several countries uh, and also several cities in the US on this call so that we could get something going in our area. We'd be glad to share, send you the care income uh, petition and any other materials that would help to get this movement to grow. Reverend Liz said it very well that we're going to need a movement pushing forward to make all of this happen. Great. Thank you, Margaret. Um, one thing we're going to do is we can save the chats that have come through because people have put up some amazing information. Um, there was some from the Welfare Warriors and, and, uh, and from really all over. So anything also you would like to share, please put it in a chat and we will somehow compile them and uh, get the information out to people. If you signed up on the webinar, we will have your email and we can uh, put you on a list to send you um, all of this. Um, 
Well, Phoebe, one other thing I did, I did mean to mention and, and mm -hmm. neglected to say, which is on um, the whole issue of indigenous people and indigenous rights here in the Americas, suggesting people look at the, the documents of the papal bulls because they're very much used as law in the United States to keep the most impoverished people in the United States who are indigenous uh, down. So that's one uh, place that I would suggest. And I know there's some indigenous people that are organizing within the Poor People's Campaign with AIM and, and other areas as well. But um, we're very much working on building that kind of black, brown unity and coming together, just very important as we're building this global movement. Thank you, Margaret. Um, yes, yeah, so we also uh, heard, you know, I think Reverend Liz Theo Harris touched on it a bit, um, but the uh, removal of children um, by the child welfare system and at detentions, um, but largely in the child welfare system because of poverty. Um, someone asked that we flag up that there is a support not separation net blog that deals with this issue. Um, Every Mother's a Working Mother Network is another one. Um, yeah, there's so much in the in the chats. I, I'm going to miss somebody, and maybe Nikki. I'll call on her again to see if there's something else we missed that she should do. I promised that I would call on um, Maggie. Uh, like to do that. Um, Peggy O'Mara has her hand up. I'll call on Peggy. Uh, and then I was hoping Selma, maybe we could hear some final words uh, from you. So let me find you, Maggie. Okay, Maggie. Yeah. Hi, yes, this is Maggie from the Global Women's Strike in Ireland. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, a piece of work we've been doing actually for many years trying to keep it in the Constitution, the Irish Constitution does value the caring work um, that mothers do. And um, there have been attempts to uh, remove it from the Irish Constitution um, for many years. And we've been working on this since 2005. And, and the reason being that the language is, you know, outdated and sexist, but it does say that, you know, mothers, you know, by, by that this, you know, by caring work, um, you know, actually give to the state um, fundamental service without which the common good could not be achieved. And it says that mothers shouldn't be obliged by economic necessity to have to go out to do wage work. Um, now, um, there was another attempt last year to, uh, by the government to abolish it uh, again. Um, and instead, a whole campaign got going, which we were part of, uh, to say, no, amend it. Get rid of the outdated and sexist language, but amend it to make sure that uh, uh, mothers and other carers of all genders are, are, are actually, that the work is valued, that they are valued. Okay, Maggie, for some reason we've lost you. Um, I'm assuming that people can hear me. Can you hear me, Eric? Uh, okay, yeah, so other people are hearing. So Maggie, we'll try to get back, get you back on. I want to call on um, Peggy. I also, before I call on Peggy, I just wanted to comment on the point that's been made about the American Family Act and the bills in Congress to give basically pay uh, family allowance or child benefit in the United States, which are great, but they're proposing doing it through the tax credit. And the, the problem we have is that that means that the benefit is likely to go through to the main breadwinner and not to the main caregiver. And we think it's really important, especially with the issue of domestic violence, it's of not to be tied to a man's paycheck, but to have that benefit uh, go through the primary caregiver um, and um, and to have the you know the recognition that that work is. So I wanted to add that in, and we're we're working on that. Okay, so Peggy, and then um, uh, and then Nikki to see if there's anything else, and then Selma. Go ahead, Peggy. You should be on. Really, I just raised my hands because I or hand because I wanted to hear what Maggie had to say about the Irish. Oops, sorry, Peggy. Okay, you wanted to hear. Okay, great. So, uh, Nikki, was there anything uh, else to to flag up? I know one question people had was about seeing this care income statement and signing it. 
um, and we will be getting that around. So if people wanted to look at it and also sign on to it, that we'll be doing that. Uh, okay, Nick, uh, Nikki. Uh, no, uh, I think that's the main point. There's a lot of information and a few other questions, small questions and people asking a lot about how to get the uh, transcripts or the recordings of this discussion and generally a lot of thanks and appreciation. But I think in terms of uh, substantial issues, I think, uh, I don't think we can go into, uh, you know, there's not much, you know, there's not, there's nothing that's major that's been missed out. Okay, great. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you for staying on top of those. Um, so, uh, we will be getting people, you know, that we, we have recorded this, uh, we will be posting it, we will be gathering the chat information, we will look through it and see if we're missing, people ask for the names of bills and the statistics and we will get those and uh, give us a little time <laughs> and we'll get them to you and, you know, uh, it Really, I just want to say before Selma starts that I feel like we've we've scratched the surface here, and there's so much to say, and this is the start, not the end. Um, and I am going to call on Selma now. Okay, Selma, you're off mute. Thank you so much for the time. I just wanted to say that Payday is the organization of men uh, who relate to uh, the global women's strike and they also work with prisoners which is terribly important work they have so much leadership to give us the implications of being poor is that you wind up in prison and i know there's a lot of women prisoners who are still doing housework from their prison cells saying what should happen with this child and what should happen with granny etc i know there's a woman who's on who can tell us about that again? Vicky Law, who's who's there? Hi, Vicky. Okay, very quickly, we work with Haiti, where there is a massive movement going on, trying still to defend the revolution that they won um, over two centuries ago against slavery and against imperialism, and we are grateful for all that they teach us. And we, we, that's one of the things we can give you information about if you're in touch with us. Uh, I wanted to say thank you so much, uh, Liz, for talking about uh, a, a movement and an international movement because you can't be anti-racist unless you're international. And it's very hard uh, with a lot of languages which you don't know and they don't know yours, but we've got to make it together. We need this movement. We need the expression in every country of what women and men and children are doing on their own behalf and trying to get together so that we can find out about how massive the struggle is, which is invisible to us, but which they're risking their lives to build. Um, um, uh, yes, there's something else that we must discuss, and that is that the women's movement sometimes has become um, an organization helping women to move up in the hierarchy and become among and become um, among become like those whom we are fighting, you know, and we're supposed to be. Um, celebrating their rise. We do not celebrate their rise from the ranks. We celebrate what Reverend Liz has said, from the bottom up and everybody moves up. Less than that will not be a victory and we worry about what it might mean. What's that word? Uh, yes, I, the other thing is the the wars mean that people are running, running for their lives. And the poverty means that, and the uh, geological destruction means that people are running to not to drown and to, to feed themselves when there isn't food any longer because the crops have been destroyed. We, those are our people. We must defend them. We must work with them. We must support their struggles and ensure that they, their struggle is always present in what we are doing. 
we want an international movement and before we can get one we must begin to act internationally to build it so that we can win finally what's that i'm trying to our career okay yes um and i was particularly glad peggy we'll give you all the information you need in relation to maggie's struggle in ireland which we've been working with her on and i'm most grateful for what you said about breastfeeding and i i think your experience we really need to be in regular touch with everybody who's on been on and you know the question of breastfeeding is the question of human survival also you know we are threatened in so many ways but we don't get weaker if we put them together we grow stronger and uh, thanks for the information you gave us uh, i must say i'm grateful for the chance to speak at this webinar which i was very skeptical about as <laughs> as i don't want everybody to know about except now that it's over and i i don't see why we can't have another one or more with other speakers and other discussions if we can talk once with success we'll talk with more success twice so thank you very okay. much for being on thank you very much for this coming together and uh, i'm i'm most grateful for what i've learned and what i think is a possibility we can pursue Selma, so, thank you and before everybody goes i'm going to unmute all and thought we could all from around the corners of the earth uh, say something together and I'm proposing we all get off and when on the count of three we say value caregiving work care income now okay so get ready get your voices ready okay unmute all okay one two three value caregiving work care income now thank you everybody thank you thank you this has been great thanks to all the wonderful speakers and thank you so much to the organizers of the webinar thank you phoebe for the idea thanks phoebe thanks everybody Really powerful. Uh, it's it's a war brush, and then the brush ain't shit. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> they walk around burning asses like a burning fire. <laughs> <laughs> People are still talking. We oh, don't want to leave each other. <laughs> okay, and I'm going off mute. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. 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 I'm gonna do Capricorn and I'm gonna do Virgo. <laughs> we gotta thank uh -oh. Eric. Eric was the tech behind no, it. Eric, thank you, Eric. 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 Eric.